Welcome to the Plant Trainers Podcast, where we're helping people improve their quality of life through nutrition and fitness. And now, your hosts, nutrition and wellness coaches, international speakers, Adam and Shoshana Chaim. Hey, I'm Adam Chaim. And I'm Shoshana Chaim, and we are Propelled, Propelled by, by plants. plants. Today, we bring to you episode 248, The Impact of Nutrition on Mental Health with Dr. Linda Plowright. In today's episode of the Plant Trainers Podcast, we talked to Dr. Linda Plowright about the impact of nutrition on mental health. Dr. Plowright has made a strong correlation between eating a plant-based diet and your overall mental health and mental illness. She helps us understand all the differences between specific mood disorders. In today's busy life, it seems like everyone spirals out of control every now and then, so being able to recognize the signs for needing help is imperative. You'll be shocked to hear what she has to say about the microbiome. This is an important episode to share with anyone who is affected by poor mental health or mental illness and their support teams as well. So we do hope that you share on Facebook, Instagram, or any other form of social media to show your support for those suffering and thriving with mental illness. Dr. Plowright is a psychiatrist working in London, Ontario. She has a fellowship in integrative medicine through the University of Arizona College of Medicine, and she's an adjunct professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Western Ontario. She's on staff at the Child and Parent Resource Institute in the Dual Diagnosis Program and at Parkwood Institute in the Operational Stress Injury Clinic. Her professional interests include integrative medicine, including nutrition, exercise, sleep, and stress management, mindfulness, clinical hypnosis, trauma, and cross-cultural health. Podcasting is like the street performing of radio. Street performers make up their acts, plan, prepare, and get all dressed up. Podcasters seduce guests into coming onto the show, prepare the show, and get the best recording gadgets. Street performers lure their audience in with a great opening act. Podcasters are constantly finding unique ways to let others know what's going on. Street performers have foot traffic to lure in, and podcasters have to work hard to get themselves out there. Street performers come back day after day because they love the way that people look when they laugh and are entertained. Podcasters come back week after week because they're passionate about their message and are humbled by how many people they help. Every now and again, you come across a performance that excites you, that you enjoy, that you can relate to, and then you throw a couple of bucks in the pot. Well, that pot for podcasters is called Patreon. It's a unique way that listeners can show their appreciation and help cover some of the hosting costs and hours of hard work that it takes to put shows out like this. So if you're feeling like this show lights you up, helps you, informs you, or maybe entertains you, maybe entertains you, we would be grateful for your donation at patreon.com slash plant trainers. Even $1 helps us cover costs and ramp up our game. Thank you to those who already contribute and to those who will. And now for a moment of gratitude. Today I'm grateful for my kicks. Gonna keep it simple. They're comfortable, they get me around, and they get a lot of compliments. And I'm not gonna lie, it feels good to be complimented every now and then. And by your kicks, you mean your running shoes? Yeah. Interesting. (laughs) I'm grateful for my mom. It's a few days away from my mom's birthday and I'm just really grateful to have her in my life still. Dr. Linda Plowright, thank you so much for joining us on the Plant Trainers Podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. We're really excited to meet you when we were in London just a couple of months ago, and your speech was just very thought-provoking. We loved what you had to talk about, and we've been really waiting to have you on to talk a little bit more about that. But before we get into things, do you have a moment of gratitude that you'd like to share with us and our listeners? Well, there's so many things that I'm grateful for, but Given the topic today, one thing that I'm really grateful for in regards to mental health is that I've seen a a slow but steady societal shift uh, towards an understanding that mental illness is actually an illness, just like other illnesses, just like heart disease, just like diabetes, and that it's, it's not a choice, it's not weakness, it's not something that somebody can just snap out of. And I know we still have a long way to go in that regard, but I'm, I'm really grateful to see that we're having that evolving understanding and more education in that regard. And I think that it's not just everybody being understanding of that person who has it, but also when you're the person with the mental illness and you feel guilty for treating it as if it's a physical disease instead of just 
a mental issue and you don't give yourself that time to heal. You don't treat it that way yourself. So I think people are starting to say, yes, I do need to take a leave of absence. I do need to stay home. I do need to treat myself well because this is bigger than what it seems. Absolutely. I think it's so much more difficult to uh, move towards recovery, to start to heal if you're not in the right frame of mind and you're not being gentle with yourself and understanding that this really is an illness and not something that's your fault. I've spoken about my own mental illness many times before on the podcast, especially in number six when I really let, left it all on the table. But one thing that I really regret, and I try not to live life with many regrets, but one thing that I do regret is when my doctor gave me a note to take time off work and I took five days off work, but went in to work on the Wednesday because there was a tournament that I wanted to supervise the kids on and didn't trust anybody else to do it and then went back to work even though I wasn't ready. I really, really do regret not taking more time, not sleeping more, not taking care of myself and just worrying about work while I was off that whole time. That's one huge moment in my life where I know I let myself down. Hmm. Well, I think it comes back to what, what you were just talking about with us understanding that it is an illness and it is something that's going to take time and that the more you can devote to the healing and the things that your body needs, then hopefully the better outcome you're going to have in the long run. It's interesting that it's it's actually an illness that people have and we don't most people don't see it that way. They do see it like you said as a weakness and something must be wrong with me if I'm feeling this way or thinking this way. And we we hear the word stigma being thrown around and how people want to get over that and start understanding that these mental issues are illnesses and society is starting to open up to that. But on an individual basis, if I'm feeling a certain way, how do I know if it's an actual mental illness or just the kind of moment is just a depressing moment and I'm just feeling sad about something? How do I differentiate a difference between a feeling of sadness versus a mental illness, so a to mental speak. Health or mental men- health versus mental health illness. versus illness, yeah. Right. Well, I think that's, that's a really important question because all of us are sad sometimes, especially when sad things happen or all of us are anxious about things. Um, and so what's the difference? And, and for somebody who's never experienced it, it may be hard for them to know. And I think it comes down to the intensity of the symptoms the duration of the symptoms, how pervasive they are in your life, how much distress they cause, and and also the impact on functioning, you know, family functioning, work functioning, uh, et cetera. When something actually is a mental illness and not just kind of the normal sadness that can come up in day-to-day life or or typical anxiety, it's going to cause a lot more distress. It's going to last for longer. It's going to impact your functioning. Also, it, it will come with it physical symptoms in the body, but also cognitive symptoms of so changing the way you think, uh, changing the way you behave, emotional symptoms. It's going to affect all of those areas. I, I think that was big for me because now when something sad or worrisome comes up, let's say a family member being in the hospital, when I'm busy and I'm doing things, it's not front of mind for me. It's not something that I'm, I'm worrying about. And then when I slow down, yeah, I, I think about it and I send a little prayer and I send some warm thoughts and I might worry and I might be sad. But when I was in my worst times, there was no differentiation between good time and bad time. Every time was a bad time. I was talking to kids and crying. I was locking myself in a room so that I would be alone. I didn't want to be around other people. It was... It was really interrupting not just my quality of life, but like any life that I had at all. And it was, it, it was devastating, really. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, yeah, I, I think that the way, the way you describe it is probably something that's helpful for other people to hear. Because these, these terms, depression and anxiety, they're kind of an umbrella terms that can encompass a lot of different experiences for people. And, and it's important to hear other people's experiences, but also for people to remember that theirs, theirs could be different. And just because it doesn't look like someone else's doesn't mean it's not a mood disorder and an anxiety disorder. But there are certain, certain kinds of symptoms, certain kind of categories of symptoms that we look for when we're making a diagnosis. 
So let's actually explain to people, if you can, please, what the difference between depression and anxiety is and mood disorder and any other kind of vocabulary that's really important for people to have an understanding about. Well, uh, depression as a diagnosable psychiatric illness, as opposed to that kind of feeling of sadness that can come in daily life, lasts for at least two weeks. And it's going to involve, like we said, physical symptoms, emotional symptoms, changes to the way you think and behave, uh, usually involving that depressed or low mood. But sometimes the mood isn't even the paramount thing. It's the loss of interest or loss of pleasure in things that you used to enjoy. And then some symptoms that go along with it. It can be feelings of um, like guilt and worthlessness and hopelessness, uh, changes to weight and appetite, so either your appetite goes up quite a bit or it can go down. Same thing with sleep, either wanting to sleep all the time or insomnia, not being able to sleep, low energy and fatigue, poor concentration, difficulty making decisions, or even thinking about death um, to the point for some people, you know, contemplating taking their own life or trying to do so. So it's it's sort of the, the pervasiveness of all those symptoms and how it's affecting uh, the different areas of your life and how long it's lasting for that makes it different from that kind of day-to-day sadness that any of us might experience. And that kind of goes along with anxiety too. Certainly any of us can be anxious. Things happen in life that you might feel anxious about. And sometimes anxiety can even come and you're not sure why you're feeling anxious. But when when something is actually an anxiety disorder, Again, it's going to be pervasive. It's going to uh, overshadow a lot of areas of your life. It's going to last for a long time. There's going to be those physical symptoms, emotional symptoms, the changes in your behavior. But with anxiety disorders, it's, it's kind of an umbrella term, and there's lots of different kinds. Some of the more common ones we see in uh, North American society would be generalized anxiety disorder, where you're anxious about lots of different topics or social anxiety disorder where people are anxious about being in social situations where they perceive that they might be judged or others might be thinking negatively of them. I was with a friend this afternoon and thank you for that. I was with a friend this afternoon and we were chatting and what we basically said is that almost everybody we know and and we're all either 40 or leading into 40 and ev- almost everybody we know these days are having some kind of meltdown or episode Mm. or midlife crisis, going on medication, Mm. seeking help, spending thousands of dollars in acupuncture. We're putting so much pressure on ourselves. You know, women, we put, uh, men put a lot of pressure on themselves too, but women, we put pressure on ourselves to have careers, to take care of the home, to take care of the family with social media. And, you know, somebody posts themselves with their family all happy on the beach and you haven't been on the beach or your family was on the beach, but nobody was happy. And it's just, you know, women are having trouble dealing with it these days and medication seems to be helping them. Does medication only help you if you do actually have mental illness or can it help anybody? Not that I'm promoting the use of medication. (laughs) I just wanted to get an idea of if it's helping them because it's actually there or if it just helps people in general. That's, I think that's actually a, a really fascinating question, and I can't necessarily answer 100% in everyone's case because it's going to be different. Does that person actually meet criteria for a mood or anxiety disorder and they're not properly recognizing the symptoms or it hasn't been diagnosed properly, and that's why it's helping them? Another thing that we know with a lot of the medications that are used for mood and anxiety disorders is that in studies they actually have a very high placebo response rate. So when somebody thinks that they're on the medication but they're actually being given a, a, an inactive sugar pill, they actually have a pretty high rate of, of responding and thinking that they are on the active medication. So, so placebo rate could be factoring in for some people as well, just feeling like, wow, I've been heard. Somebody is acknowledging what I'm going through and and they're wanting to help me and treat me, that in and of itself could be giving somebody a response. So it's hard to say in each person's case whether it's that they they truly are having a neurochemical response to the medication, whether it's that, that feeling heard, that placebo response. It's hard to say in each case. That's really interesting. And do you think that there, or do you know that there are higher rates of anxiety disorder or mood disorders in urban life as opposed to rural life? That's been a really interesting thing that's come out because we know that the rates of mental illness are increasing. I mean, vastly. 
just since World War II, the rate of major depressive disorder has increased tenfold to the point where the World Health Organization predicts that by 2030, more people worldwide are going to be uh, impacted by depression than any other health condition. And then when they're looking at those increasing rates of mental illness in general, what has been found is that in industrialized nations like Canada, like the United States, the rates for mental illness are actually higher than in poorer countries. And then even within the industrialized nations, the rates for mental illness are higher within urban settings versus more rural country settings, which is really interesting, I think, to see because there's so many factors that could be impacting that, right? I mean, I could just, we could just talk for a whole hour just about all the different factors that could be playing into that. But what I think is important about that is that it means that, yes, genetics are important, yes, brain chemistry is important, but it also means that external factors, environmental lifestyle factors, they're important in both the development and maintenance of mental illness. And if that's the case, if those factors are so important, then why aren't they being more addressed, more front and center when we're developing a mental health treatment plan for someone? I mean, I'm not anti-medication by any stretch of the imagination, but I am anti-using medication as the sole treatment and not addressing all the other factors, not looking at that kind of whole picture and filling in as many pieces of the puzzle as you can. So if we're going to fill in more pieces to the puzzle, let's get into some of the tofu and kale, let's say, of, of it and see, we also have higher rates of obesity. We also have higher rates of diabetes. We also have higher rates of arthritis and osteoporosis and all of these other diseases. So where is the link between mental health and physical health and the foods that we're eating because we know that 80% of the physical diseases that people have are not necessary through lifestyle and and nutrition they don't necessarily have to be there so is there a link between the amount of McDonald's that we have in our countries and the amount of McDonald's that these poorer countries have and our actual mental health is it because of the foods that we're eating well I think that there is a long list of things, right? So we could be looking at lack of physical activity, too much technology, being too isolated socially, you know, not having access to nature and green spaces. There's a huge long list. But yes, absolutely, diet, nutrition is going to be, I think, a really important factor on that list. One thing that that's come out is that there's this bi-directional link between what we would typically consider physical illnesses, especially the ones that that we would call the diseases of affluence, the ones that we see more commonly in richer countries. So uh, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, heart disease, diabetes, some kinds of cancers, and then the quote-unquote mental illnesses, so things like depression, mood disorder, anxiety. We know that when you have those physical illnesses, it greatly increases your risk for developing mental illness. And conversely, when you have depression or anxiety, et cetera, it greatly increases your risk for developing those diseases of affluence. So we're now seeing that these physical and mental illnesses are linked. And so it seems to me to make sense that if we know that, then how come the things that we already know to do for heart disease and diabetes, things like being more physically active, like changing our nutrition, well, wouldn't that apply to mental illness as well? And if so, then why, why do we not talk about that more when we're treating mental illness? I know that that's, diet is never anything that any of the health practitioners that I saw throughout my days had ever spoken to me about. But one of the first things that I started talking about is when I did go plant-based and was eating a very clean diet, that my mental ability, my my clarity was so much better, my energy was so much better, and I was able to use my tools that I did have so much more, where if I get caught up in a rut where I'm, you know, just eating a lot of refined carbohydrates or higher in sugar, or I've eaten, you know, one too many meals in a restaurant that had fried foods in it, and I get into a rut, then I have a lot of trouble reaching for those tools, and I just kind of spiral out of control. I think that that that's an excellent point because you know I do want to emphasize that changing someone's diet it's it's not a substitute for 
for getting help, right? You still need to access mental health supports when you're struggling with a mental illness. Uh, It's not that that's a substitute for that, but it can be a very important piece of someone's recovery. And just like you're saying, it can help you to make use of the other tools as well, of the other strategies that are, are going to help you in that path to recovery. There's no question that mood follows food, and that's something that our friend Rich Roll always says. And we notice it ourselves, like was just said. I mean, if you... You, the listeners right now, if you think about the last thing you ate and how it made you feel, there's real big impact there. And that's probably an exercise that more people should experience more often and actually pay attention to the food they put in their body and how their body and mind actually react to that food. Because it does change the way you feel. It does change the way you think. And having a clearer mind and being able to focus more on anything is really a benefit and a bonus and you should have that experience all the time Mm -hmm. absolutely let's talk a minute for the gut because we've talked about gut bacteria before in many different ways but when we did hear you speak in london you were talking about the correlation between your gut bacteria and your mental health so can you elaborate that for us a little bit I think that's a a really interesting evolving area of research. We're taking a short break to let you know that this episode of the Plant Trainers podcast is sponsored by Legrand Power of Plants. They are a Quebec-based company that prepares fresh plants into ready-to-eat meals and condiments to promote and facilitate a healthy and balanced lifestyle. You know that the benefits of a plant-based diet can improve your blood pressure, decrease heart disease, lower cholesterol, and better control weight but it can be hard preparing every meal from scratch. That's why we're so glad that Legrand products have made their way into Ontario and parts of the United States. They have products we trust at our own dinner table and offer high quality ingredients and nutrients that even kids enjoy. Their pastas, sauces, pestos, soups, and chilies are some of the best out there and allow families to get back to the healthy dinner table again. Legrand's products are a bridge to a clean, real food eating way of life by harnessing the power of plants every day so you can experience your full vitality. Check out the link in the show notes or visit legrandpoweroflants.com to find out where these products are sold near you. You can also ask your local health food store about carrying their soups, chilies, sauces, and pestos. And now back to the show. Uh, And the current thinking is that our gut bacteria is intimately linked to our mental health. Uh, Our gut bacteria and and sort of the larger term would be the microbiome, so that kind of collective term for all the microbes, so bacteria, fungi, viruses, etc., that live inside and on the human body. And I mean, I know I wasn't aware until I learned in medical school that actually nine out of 10 cells in the human body actually belong to microbial species. So, so like 99% of the DNA in our bodies actually belongs to microbes, which is, sort of just blows the mind how much of our bodies, how much of our DNA is made up of these microbes. And I think a lot of times when we hear microbes and bacteria, we think of them as being you know, potentially disease-causing, gross, germs, harmful. Yeah. yeah, germs, exactly. And, and that, that's true. A lot of them are. But there's actually a lot of the microbes that live on or in our body that are super important, not just for our health, but our survival. In lots of different ways, they, they help us manufacture essential vitamins like vitamin K and several of the B vitamins. Uh, they boost our immune system. They help us moderate our metabolism and our appetite and how we store fat. But then when you're looking at mental illness or mental health, they have been shown to be linked to anxiety, to depression, to overall emotional resiliency. And it's interesting because in mental health, we talk a lot about the neurotransmitters, the different chemicals that are in your brain that are linked to depression and anxiety and mental wellness like serotonin and dopamine. And then we talk about the medications we use, things like Prozac and Zoloft, but those medications, they don't actually contain serotonin. They just help your body to use the serotonin more effectively. But your body still has to make serotonin, and 95% of that is actually made in your gut, and it's made by the microbes. So if you're not eating a diet that's helping the right beneficial microbes to flourish, to have a healthy gut microbiome, then it may be that it's not able to effectively make the serotonin or the other neurotransmitters that you need. 
And it makes me wonder, well, then I might be prescribing Prozac or Zoloft to someone, but if they don't have a healthy microbiome, are they going to be able to effectively use that medication? Yeah, it's super interesting. The gut is really a complex thing. And you explained a lot of it just now, but we did do a whole episode with Dr. Will Bolsowitz, the Happy Gut MD, episode 219, for anybody listening that wants more information about probiotics, fermentation, the gut microbiome. We talked a lot about that and it was very informative. And the gut is so complex and it's all brand new, pretty new, relatively research that we're learning about that Mm -hmm. is having so much impact on everything in our lives right now. So it's really fascinating stuff. Absolutely. And, And I think that it would be helpful for more and more doctors medical doctors to be recommending that we do change the foods that we eat, not just when it comes to cholesterol or blood pressure or obesity, that there is a better recognition amongst all health professionals that there is such a huge link between food and and our mental health, really. Well, I think that there's so many different ways that the food can impact mental health. And talking about that, that bi-directional link, how it increases your chance of developing different physical illnesses, that's one way. Uh, How it impacts your microbiome, that's another way. One of the things that's, I think, underlying all these different points is inflammation. Mm. And that's something that's also been a really big area of research is how kind of chronic widespread inflammation in the body may be a really important factor in the development of heart disease and diabetes and cancers, et cetera, but also depression and anxiety and and different mental illnesses. And one way that we can impact inflammation in our life is through our diet, is through eating a diet that's going to be more anti-inflammatory. And the really excellent thing about that is that it can impact your risk of developing mental illness, and also it can help you potentially to treat it. So... Not only are we treating our arthritis, our achy bones and muscles from workouts, well, I guess not bones, but our achy muscles from workouts, not only are we treating, you know, our our skin and all of that, but we're actually treating our brain at the same time when we're eating a diet that's rich in leafy greens and all the rest. Yeah, and it's been really interesting, even just in the, in the time that I've been practicing, we're starting to see a little bit more understanding, but somehow in in mental health and in psychiatry, we've treated the brain as though it were somehow separate from the rest of the body. And I don't think we do that in any other specialty because the cardiologist, they're never going to treat the heart in isolation from the rest of the body. If you also have diabetes, well, they know that that's an important factor, that that the health of your pancreas is going to be intimately linked to the health of your heart. And so in all other areas of medicine, I, I think we know that the different parts of your body are interlinked, but somehow in psychiatry, we almost sort of treated the brain and mental illness in isolation and, well, I'm going to leave the rest of it. You know, your cardiologist can deal with that. Your family doctor can deal with that. I'm not going to address that because I'm your psychiatrist. But now we're starting to see that they're all intimately linked. And so eating a diet that's going to promote the health of your heart and your pancreas and all those other organ systems is the same kind of diet that you need to promote the health of your brain and your mental health. I'm going to get on a tangent for a minute. And I I love my mother, but I hope that the information that she gave me was wrong. But we have a family member who's in a hospital that's specific for hearts. And what she told me is that they don't have an endocrinologist there. They don't have other doctors there to deal with other things. This hospital is specific to hearts and only deals with hearts. And they need to bring in doctors from other hospitals and maybe they visit once a week to be able to take care of the whole body. Now, as you can imagine, I lost it. (laughs) I completely lost it on her. Not that it's her fault, but I really hope that she had her information wrong and I should look into it more because I was outstanding. I I couldn't understand for a moment how you can have a hospital with only cardiologists and no other kind of doctors in the hospital because normally... For most Americans or most Canadians who are having heart problems, that's not their only problem, right? And usually it's linked to other problems and or linked to other medications that they've been taking for their other problems. Have have you heard of hospitals that are specialized only in one area and don't even really have doctors who are trained to deal with the other parts of the body? Well, we often compartmentalize these things, but hopefully I, I can't speak 
to to that particular hospital, but hopefully they do bring in other specialists to consult. So it may be that the cardiologist is sort of running the show in that area, but hopefully they are bringing in other specialists to consult if someone has mental health issues, if they need to see an endocrinologist, et cetera. I mean, we do that in, in mental health. If somebody is under a psychiatric admission, then you would have the psychiatrist as the attending physician, but hopefully if that person uh, also needed to see a cardiologist, endocrinologist, et cetera, you could bring somebody else in to consult and, and help you develop a more holistic treatment plan. That's certainly, I think, the, the hope or the gold, gold standard anyways of treatment. Mm-hmm. A, a, a little bit off topic, but I think I, I did my face turn all red. Purple. <laughs> like, like it, it just it just upsets me that we spend all of this time recognizing the whole body. You know, it's not just nutrition. It's not just fitness. It's, you know, it's not just meditating. It's everything all together. And um, I think I just kind of lost it there for a moment. I apologize, everybody. But what I wanted to know is what are some of the specific foods that people can be eating to try to reduce anxiety and depression, and what are some of the scientific evidence that supports it? Well, I think it comes down to talking a little bit about why it is that food impacts mental health, and then and then talking a little bit about so then what food that would be. And so we've talked about inflammation as being uh, an important factor, but I, it also comes down to the fact that uh, our bodies have to make our brain cells. So you have to be eating the right foods to help them make healthy brain cells. So an example there would be omega-3 fatty acids, how that's important in the outer membrane of the brain cell. That's just one example. And then we talked a little bit about the neurotransmitters, the dopamine, the serotonin, uh, all the different neurotransmitters. It's important to be eating foods that help your body have the building blocks to make them. It's also important to know that there's some nutritional deficiencies that can worsen or mimic mental health symptoms, like iron deficiency, vitamin B12 deficiency, vitamin D deficiency. And in North America, we often eat a a diet that is really, really overfeeding us, but undernourishing us. So even though most of us have way too much food to eat, it's surprising that we can still have nutritional deficiencies. Uh, It's also important because when you are dealing with a mental illness, some of the symptoms of that mental illness can actually worsen your nutrition. So whether that's because you're self-medicating through food, because you have a loss of appetite, because you're having poor absorption, because you're having bowel symptoms like diarrhea, and also a lot of the medications that we use in the treatment of mental illness can have effects on your nutritional status. So examples there would be antipsychotic medications. They can cause weight gain, increase appetite, increase cholesterol and blood sugar, or ADHD medications, which can really reduce the appetite and cause weight loss. And also we know that when you improve your nutrition, that may be able to help the psychiatric medications work more effectively. So an example there would be if somebody doesn't have enough folate in their diet, that can lead to a decreased responsiveness to antidepressant drugs. And actually, there's some evidence that indicates that maybe folate supplementation might be able to augment antidepressant therapy. So there's lots of different ways that what we eat or what our nutrition is like can be impacting our mental health. But I think then it sounds really complicated, right? Like, oh, I must be having to eat all sorts of different things. Maybe I need to be eating a pound of goji berries. Or, but it actually doesn't have to be all that complicated. It doesn't have to be expensive. You don't have to shop at a special store. Because really the broad principles about nutrition are the most important. Eating a whole food, plant-based diet, that's going to give you all the things that you need to do all the things that I just talked about. It's going to reduce inflammation. It's going to reduce your risk of heart disease and all the other physical illnesses. It's going to give you the right building blocks to make healthy brain cells, to make those neurotransmitters, to support a healthy microbiome. It's really sort of wonderful because although there's lots of different ways that nutrition impacts mental health, it's sort of one answer. It's, it's one diet or one way of nourishing yourself that's going to support all those different factors. I love putting that message out there because normally when you, let's say you were doing a workout for the body and you're going to lift weights and do strength training, you need to do specific exercises for your ankles and your calves and your quads and your stomach and your different parts of your arms and your back and your neck. But when it comes to taking care of your body from a nutrition point of view, it really is just all one prescription, so to say. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that that's, that's really exciting. And the wonderful thing about it is 
there's virtually no negative side effects to it. In fact, the side effects are actually that it's going to decrease your risk of all sorts of other illnesses in the long run. One ring to rule them all. It's, a, it's amazing. It's such a simple concept, but we, we tend to complicate things and we fall into the media and the marketing and we fall victim to all that. And it's really not a difficult thing to be able to eat whole foods and people just need to learn how to do it, try to do it and see the difference and benefit that it makes to them individually. Yeah, and we're not we're not immune to that. Obviously, in the the medical community, I know when when I was training, we got very little education in nutrition, sort of beyond the Canada Food Guide. But despite that, I still think most people and and most physicians as well, we we think we have a handle on nutrition, and unfortunately, I think that that leaves us too susceptible to the kind of trendy or fad diets, the the paleo diet, the keto diet, all of that, and and that includes physicians. And I think that for me, that can be a difficult position to be in because I find that a lot of physicians will see a whole food plant-based diet as being another one of those trendy diets, kind of at best or at worst, they might see it as being very extreme or very restrictive, uh, not evidence-based or, or even potentially dangerous. And so I'm so thankful to have colleagues like, you know, Dr. Greger and Dr. Kahn and uh, Dr. Barnard, because otherwise it can it can be a little bit lonely sometimes when you're here ringing your bell as loudly as you can and saying, no, look over here. This, is, this isn't like that. This isn't a, a trendy diet. This is something that's, that's highly evidence-based. Uh, so I'm very thankful for the other colleagues that I have who are out there touting the same message. I wanted to say that that's actually one of the things that I wanted to ask you about is what are your other colleagues in your practice doing right now with plant-based nutrition? How do they see you and are you actually using it with your clients? Well, so I, I don't have a lot of other colleagues that are plant-based. I can think of one <laughs> and, and, and other people that I've heard of but that I don't necessarily know personally. Uh, and it, it can be a, uh, lonely or anxiety-provoking, actually, because I feel very strongly about a whole foods plant-based diet. But I'd, I'd be lying if I said I never worried about how I could be perceived by colleagues or employers. Again, if people don't have that information and they're just reading headlines uh, that, that maybe put a whole food plant-based diet in, in a bad light uh, that don't have evidence behind them. So it can be a bit of a, a difficult position to be in. And I, I'm thoughtful, I would say, in terms of how I address nutrition with my patients. And some of that is because, you know, I do work for larger, larger organizations. But it's also because when I am working with somebody who potentially is, is so depressed that they're not even able to, to feed themselves or get out of bed, uh, then to say to them, okay, what you need to do is, you know, hit the gym and, you know, cook a stir fry. This is just, it's just way too much, right? So we have to, I have to address somebody where they're at and we have to do a treatment plan that's going to be one step at a time. And once somebody is well enough that they're eating regularly and they're wanting to make healthier choices, then we really work on eating a more whole foods diet and making it to start with at least a plant-focused diet. And then I have had people who are on board with that and they're getting better and they want to take it even further. And then absolutely I have talked with people about going fully plant-based. But I have to meet somebody also where they're at and it has to be an incremental approach. Wouldn't it be amazing if there were aides to work with people with mental health who would cook their meals for them and put on their running shoes for them and take them out to the gym and do their CBT or whatever whatever kind of techniques that they're working on with their doctors and just do that with them all day long, just like there are for, for other illnesses as well, people who help, who bathe you and feed you and, and all of that. And how much progress would people with mental health make if they had somebody who can feed them properly all day long, not just food, but all of these ideas that so that it's not overwhelming for the patient so that it's kind of just done for them. And as they learn to, to live their own lives again, then, you know, that aid can kind of step back a little bit. It's just an interesting idea that popped into my head right there. 
Well, I think you're right that when we're, we're dealing with what can potentially be a chronic illness, that having a team-based approach is going to give people the best outcome. And I'm, I'm really lucky where I work, both the locations I'm working at. I do work with a team, so, you know, social workers or occupational therapists, behavior consultants, etc. cetera. And, and I'm really lucky to work with some great, highly educated, caring individuals. And, and I've really seen that when there is that team-based approach, people have better outcomes. But yes, absolutely. If I could also have a <laughs> recreational therapist and a plant-based dietitian on my team and someone who was maybe teaching them stress management strategies like mindfulness or meditation, I, I would just love to add to the team and have people who could help with those areas. Oh, well, let me know if you're looking into that <laughs> one day. <laughs> absolutely. Great. So what can we tell the listeners if they're looking to improve or support their mental health, their current state, and make it a more positive one? What, is, what are the steps that someone would take to try to improve or maintain a positive mental state? Hmm. Well, I think one of, the, one of the first things to know about that is that when somebody is experiencing difficulties with their mental health, if what we have underlying that is inflammation, well, we know that when your body is experiencing that inflammation, it thinks that it's sick. So it's going to send you all these signals to do something we call sickness behavior. So that's when you just feel like you need to rest, you need to isolate, you need to potentially eat uh, calorically rich foods like refined carbohydrates, when people are not interested in getting outside. And that's actually really healthy behavior if you are acutely ill, like you got a cold or flu, right? That's what you need to do to heal. But when you are dealing with something like mental illness, your body is still sending you all these sickness behavior signals. But the thing that you need to do to get well, and I recognize that this is very difficult, is to know that those signals are lies. And that what you need to do to get better is to actually ignore them and do the opposite. To get outside, access to green spaces, to fresh air, to socialize, to eat healthy foods, to be physically active. You need to do the opposite of that, even though your body is telling you that what you need to do is isolate and, and lie down. Well, that sounds hard. I, but, but, I, but I hear you on that because there's been so many times in the last six years where I've actually canceled plans or not gone to things that I should have gone to. And in looking back, I know that that's probably exactly what I needed. I didn't want to be with people, but I probably needed to socialize. I didn't want to be out in the cold, but I probably needed the fresh air, right? Mm -hmm. It, it, it makes mm -hmm. complete sense to me having been on that side. Yeah. Well, and that's why I think that the other maybe important tips or, or steps that someone could take would be to educate themselves on signs and symptoms of mental illness so that you can have that greater recognition and say, well, that's my depression talking or that's my anxiety talking. So you know, because sometimes you do need to rest. Sometimes that is the treatment. But knowing when that's the healthy choice and when that's the illness talking, that's really important. And then, and then getting help, recognizing that eating a healthy diet or, or being physically active, that, that isn't a substitute for actually getting help and getting support. And that can be support from professionals. I, you know, obviously I advocate for that. Support from friends and family that you trust it can be support from people with lived experience with mental illness. And, and that can also be support from professionals for how to eat healthy, regarding how to exercise healthy and not injure yourself. Uh, different ways to manage stress, such as, you know, teaching meditation or mindfulness. And so kind of amassing that team I think is going to be the thing that, that may be most important to someone because there are going to be times when it's going to be overwhelming and you're going to be struggling and having that team of support around you is integral to recovery for most people. If you had one overlying message that you want people to hear, what is that? That for many people, mental illness can be chronic or at least waxing and waning over time. And it's important for us to know that that doesn't mean that we can't have some control over our health and our healing and our recovery. I think a lot of us feel that, well, it's genetic. You know, everybody in my family has it, so I have it too, and, you know, therefore I'm just stuck with it. I'm kind of a victim of my genetics. 
but actually we now know that there's something called epigenetics, and that's outside factors that can turn on or off genes. And a lot of the things that we've been talking about here, those lifestyle factors, those are the things that can turn on and off your genes. So yes, you may have a family history of it, but you can still make the choices every day, and when we're talking about eating multiple times per day, that can change your genetics, that can change your life, and and therefore you have the opportunity to make a real difference in your mental health. It's not your fault that you're struggling with mental illness, but at the same time, you have opportunities every day to move towards recovery. I think that's a very powerful message and a great way to end off. I think that you shared so many incredible facts and tips today and you're helping to educate so many people on ways to deal with their mental illness and maintain a positive mental health so thank you for that if there are people that want to reach out to you where would be the best place for them to connect so the uh, education department at uh, one of the locations that i work with they'd be a, a great a great place to email so that's cpri dot educate at ontario dot ca so anybody is welcome to email there and reach out and yeah i'd be be happy to answer questions or speak more amazing we'll link to that in our show notes and i just want to say on behalf of both of us thank you so much again dr plowright we really appreciate you spending time with us tonight thank you it's been my pleasure thank you Thank you so much for listening to this edition of the Plant Trainers Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or any other podcast listening platforms. We appreciate the feedback we receive from you. Every time we get a five-star rating or review on iTunes from one of our fans, it ensures other people will find us too. Thanks to our patrons. To become a patron, visit www.patreon.com slash plant trainers. Even supporting us with $1 really makes a difference. Connect and follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Plant Trainers. Like Plant Trainers on Facebook, join our newsletter, and check out our website at www.planttrainers.com for awesome plant-based recipes and a list of our services. Email your questions to info at planttrainers.com so we can answer them on our upcoming Facebook Lives. We hope we've inspired you today. Join us again next time and have a healthy day.